welcome everybody to uh, our Save Newbury Wildlife um, meeting and presentation. We're very excited everyone's here today. Uh, I'll just go ahead and say right first off that uh, we're very excited about April 30th, which is town meeting. So for those of you who are Newbury residents, we ask that you spread the word to your neighbors and attend the meeting. It's going to be at Triton at 7 p.m. And we are the fourth um, article to be voted on because we're citizens. Um, so this will be basically requesting a home rule petition from the state so that we can regulate um, escars on private property. Uh, I'm guessing that a lot of people in our audience that day will not be there for our citizens petition. They will be there probably regarding the zoning, the house, uh, zoning housing. Um, so we might have a big crowd and a lot of them will be unaware of what we're asking for. So if any of you feel comfortable standing up and supporting it after the article has been presented, that would be very helpful. Um, if you have an anecdote, um, your own experiences, that could be helpful. But even just standing up and saying why you think this is a good idea it would be very helpful to get the rest of the group to say, oh yes, this sounds like a good idea, let's go. So that's April 30th. So moving on, we have Robert Lynn Scott today. He is from North Shore Wildlife. Uh, he is a problem animal control agent. Am I saying that right? And he manages rodents and other animals without poison. So without further ado. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you ladies for inviting me from City of Newbury Wildlife. If you guys haven't checked out their Facebook page and liked it, that's a good idea. So it needs all the support it can get. So you guys are here this morning because you're concerned, as most of us are, about the SCARS thing that's going on. And so I'm sure you've heard about an eagle or a hawk coming down and scooping up a rat or a mouse that's been infected or ingested SCARS, which is a second generation anti-poiatic genocide. And if it has enough of it, in the carcass, the birds get sick. That's been the popular story. It's been going on for quite a while. And it's been the, traditionally, it's been the go-to pest control method for years, poison. The first generation um, wasn't as potent and it didn't last as long in the carcass or in the dead rodent. So when they came up with the second generation, it was more potent, it killed more, Perceivably killed more and it lasted longer, which is dangerous. So today I am going to talk about, we're going to talk about SCARs. I'm sure you guys have probably done some research on it. We're going to talk about SCARs. I want to talk about integrated pest management. And that's what we use to uh, control the rodent population. It's what most pest control companies use. Um, only I don't I use poison in anything that we do. I don't think it's necessary. I read labels on my food. I don't even like to eat. <laughs> eat poison, although I've been known to eat that type of food. <laughs> but I, 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 it's important that poison is poison, no matter how we look at it, right? So, it, and it's been affecting a lot of things, and there's a lot of ripple effects, which we'll go over also. So we're gonna go over what SCARS is, we'll talk about integrated pest management, and then I wanna go over some things that you guys can do in your own homes that can keep rodents out without using poisons or without hiring a company and if you're handy, this stuff is easy, guys. It's like handy in work. It's just knowing how to do it and the right way to do it. I'm going to talk about that. So let's see. So the problem with it, you guys see that okay? Yeah, I know. <laughs> What's happening, if you don't know this, is what it does is the second generation coagulants, or anticoagulants, don't clot blood. So the rodents bleed from the inside. So once they get enough, yeah, it's kind of good. So they're bleeding internally, right? And so, and like I talked about, unlike the first generation, it's more potent and it has a longer half-life. And half-life means that it's lasting longer in the carcass. So if you hear half-life, that's what it means. It means that the poison is just lingering around a lot longer, right? So we're, we're killing them from the inside and then the poison just sits there. Questions, comments, wisecracks? <laughs> These are five of the more common rodenticides. Um, and I did a little thing on the end so that we could spell it. We can pronounce it. Rodifarpin, Rodimadiolone, 
Menachem, Lokumifin, and Dipetiol. And those are what you typically find in organicides in the second generation stuff that a lot of the pest control companies use. And a lot of those companies are putting those, those black boxes that we see. You guys have all seen those, right? They're on the sidewalks, maybe near restaurants. And oftentimes there's poison in there. Those are supposed to be locked. So the pest control company has a lock, and they're supposed to tag those, or company um, that set it, and there's a lock so that nobody can get in there. Sometimes those black boxes have these in them. So they don't always have poison in them. So if you see a black box, it could be that there's a snap trap in there. Uh, but oftentimes it's poison. Like I mentioned earlier, it's been the go-to method. Um, it's easy, right, to use. It's inexpensive, which has made it very popular because it costs more money to have it, somebody come and seal up your house and do preventative work like I do because it takes a little bit more manpower. Right? But to throw some poison down, I remember when I first started in this business, I had a guy who owned a small pest control company, and he, he wanted to show me, like, this is what I do. I mean, he took me under his wing for a little bit. I soon like, <laughs> left his wing because I, you know, the whole poison thing and the way he handled it wasn't something I wanted to do. I just made a wild life on the wing. <laughs> um, but what he would do is he'd go in, and he just throw like little packets down, right, for mice. And he just go up and throw it in, and that was that was it. And he put powder down so we could track the mice. So we'd see where they're going. You could just find their trails. But they were going in, eating little packets, right? We've all seen them, right? They'll throw them in your attic or we'll throw them in the basement, and they're just laying around. And the mice eat the little packets, and then they take off, right? And it's just poison. But it's easy, right? So it's been an, it's an easy method. And it was effective, but now we've been doing it probably, I don't know, 50 or 60 years, I don't know the number, and now we're starting to see the effects of it, right? So now science has come a long way where we're actually, okay, let's, let's see what's happening. Birds are just dying, right? I've had calls where animals are just dead in the lawn, and I'm talking to the customer, and I'm, I'm like, well, do they, are they injured? Are, <laughs> is their stomach open? Because sometimes a coyote or a fish or cat, but nothing's wrong with them. Right, so and then people are starting, well, what's going on? And I talk to people where they've taken them to, you know, to the lab or it knows a buddy that's a scientist or whatever, and they'll do, do an autopsy and find out that there's S-cars right in, inside the animal. Um, so they're so it's what's happening is the poison isn't just targeting the mice now, right? So it's 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 become a significant risk to non-target species, birds of prey, mammals, pets. We recently did, uh, oh, we're still doing it, mice work at this big apartment complex, there's six buildings, and I'm going in and out of apartments, right? So we're doing exclusion work on the outside, and we're also going inside the apartment and setting snap traps, right? Because it's, it's humane, it's safe, not all. And sometimes, if you have pets, we have a solution for that, but um, I'm talking to these people in the apartment complexes, and a few of them have told me that um, their cats have just died for no reason, right? A young cat. But what's happening is previous companies have put poison down, and then the mice went from one apartment to the other apartment, and a cat gets a mouse, and it's just dying. We've heard, I've had three stories of that in that same, in the same building that that happened. So they're suffering secondary poisoning, and it's leading to health issues. So we're talking about children accidentally ingesting bait or poison wounds. I don't know how well, the pets and children might accidentally. If you have, if, if you poison, if you put poison in your basement and your kids are playing in your basement, it's common sense, right? They can accidentally, or if they accidentally handle a dead uh, mouse, the mouse dies and it ends up in the middle of the basement and your kid's downstairs and they handle it, not healthy. It's not healthy for the scientists or for my technicians going into a lot of these places where there's poison. 70% um, of certain birds of prey <coughs> are testing positive in some regions. That's a high number. The 
Sam Joaquin Kit Fox, a California guys. Heard the story. So they're finding that they're being they're being affected. Um, I did a little research on this. I guess they're. Pardon me. I'm getting, uh, I'm getting lost in my mind. Escars does not discriminate between pests. Beneficial wildlife, it kills species that naturally help control world populations. So we're affecting the ecological consequences of what's actually supposed to happen. So we have the animals that are supposed to keep the rodent population down, but they can't because they're getting sick. And now there's resistance to SCARs. So the poisons are less effective, and now we have to start upping the dose to make it more effective, which makes the problem worse. All right, so integrated pest management. So this is more of a holistic approach, although it does state, if you read down towards the bottom there, when it's necessary, it will require poison. So what we do is we find how they're getting in, we do exclusion work on the outside of your home. So let's just use your home as an example. We do exclusion work on the outside of the home, and then we set traps, right? So the snap trap, and a lot of people feel, well, does anyone here feel that the snap traps are not safe or that they're mean? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So they're better than the alternatives, like the sticky traps. The sticky traps are bad. Right? So we've all seen them or maybe even used them. Anyone use sticky traps in our house? No. I've had a few customers that have used them and we pulled mice out off the sticky traps. It's not, it's not pleasant. Because they still live. The snap traps are icky, I guess. Um, but they're quick and they're more humane. The problem is that if we're not bringing the population down in your home, they, it grows so fast in your house because they populate so quickly, we have to do something. So there are some other alternatives. There are some, like, uh, you guys seen those live boxes, right? Those, they don't, they're not as effective, unfortunately. So I've used them a few times. We have caught some mice in there, but they don't really bring the population down. They just don't. So it becomes, okay, what's the balance? Do we do, we do the quick kill, to bring the population down, right? And save the house because if they if they get overpopulated in your home, now you're talking about them getting in your insulation, they're urinating, they're pooping in your attic, in your walls, um, they're chewing possibly through wires, right? And it, it gets to be a dangerous situation. It can be a dangerous situation. So what we do is we set the snap traps. Now, uh, I, people go, oh, I set snap traps and it's caught the mouse or the rat on the leg. And so that becomes the problem, right? So they're they're not dying right away. Well, that can be minimized by how you set your traps. So if you're just setting traps willy-nilly out in, like in your attic, right? Like right on the nail. <laughs> <laughs> if you set them willy-nilly out in the open, you're going to have a problem. Because they're just possibly going to be walking by and they're going to get caught in the trap. But if you set it up against the wall like that, you're more than likely going to get them, and it's going to get them in the head, right? And we want a quicker, painless kill, right? We have to bring the population down. So we set them up against the wall. That's mouse traps too, because they're going to walk up against the wall. Mice and rats don't see very well, so they'll use walls and things as a guideline. So if you set them that way, you're going to have less of a problem. The other thing we use is hardware cloth. Rats and mice can't chew through. So if you say, let's say you found an entry point, right? Maybe around your basement window or somewhere by, uh, oftentimes mice will get through like your garage door. If you set some of this on the inside or on the outside and you screw it in, I'll use a screw and some washers. And that'll uh, become a barricade and you can block off the entry points. If you have a mouse problem, you find little holes, you don't want to use hardware cloth. Everybody knows about the stealable stuff, right? You can use this stuff. I like the number two gauge. 
uh, but they make them in different gauges. You want to put this right in the hole, tuck it in the hole. I like to use this stuff from Home Depot, Ultra Clear. Only use this outside because it smells. It has a, it has a strong odor. Um, you don't want to use this inside. You can use this stuff. But, so this will seal this stuff in there. I've had people tell me, well, I just foam it, but the mice and the rats will eat through the foam. So you want to make sure this is, maybe either, if you're going to use foam, like that stuff, that orange stuff that you can get from Devo, um, you can do that. You want to make sure you're using something that's made of either steel wool or copper mesh or something. They sell all kinds of different products. Okay. In the hole, seal it with the, uh, the stuff or the foam. <coughs> this is a, this is called Purple Act. This is something we use, I buy this from a supplier. This is made for pest control. Um, but for rodents, unless you're putting this stuff in the hole and you can fill it in with a foam because this hardens and it will hold whatever you put in the hole. And it works pretty well for that. Great for bats. <coughs> I love these. These are the foam guns. That's actually those. I just bought that one. Um, so the biological control habitat manipulation modification of cultural practices. So uh, when I go to a home and there's a rodent problem, I look, I scan the whole property. So are they composting? Big problem. Everybody likes, to, not everybody, but people like to compost and it's great for the environment and it makes sense. But if you're going to do it, you have to seal up your compost. Yeah, and have, I mean, even the big plastic bins that people use, the thick ones even, rats can shoot right through those. If they really want in, they're going to get in. So you have to make a decision either to build something that's going to keep them out or uh, stop composting. Bird feeders, everybody loves the birds. Um, feeding the squirrels, right? So bird feeders will bring skunks to your house. I've, I've gone to homes where I've come to tour trapping for skunks and uh, they're, they're just coming around because the bird feeder is always full. So you just have to be mindful. Um, bird feeders bring all kinds of animals, squirrels, skunks, they can bring coyotes. I mean, the reason they bring coyotes is because the bird feeders bring the squirrels and the skunks, right? So they can bring larger other predatory animals to your home. Um, if I look for that, uh, if I'm in a neighborhood, if I get called for, like I've done some restaurant work, right? Is the dumpster open? Is there a grease trap outside, right? If you live near a restaurant, you might want to be mindful. A big thing that happened when COVID hit was that, and this is, the, I saw the surge because we got the calls. Uh, all the dumpsters were empty because the restaurants were shut down. So the food supply was completely cut off. So all the rats just dispersed into suburban areas and went into neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Right. So the calls started coming in. Rats in the house. If uh, the town's digging up the road close by, stirs up all the rats. Right. So be mindful of those things. If someone's uh, dropping a house close in your neighborhood, like an old abandoned home, um, it, be mindful because they're going to just go and they're going to go everywhere. We just had Linfield hired us. They were, someone's home was condemned and it was just a mess. And they hired us to come in and bring the population, the rat population down first before um, they dropped the house, which was smart because they knew that they were going to go everywhere as soon as they did. Um, your trash cans, you know, if you don't have a bin, or uh, metal cans, you might want to consider building something or having something separate. Think about raccoons, though, too, because raccoons can lift. <laughs> they, they, yeah, they, don't want, they don't care. They'll just lift the lids right off. They'll get right in. I've had customers that actually build things to keep their trash cans in there, but, and the raccoons just come up and just grab it and just get right in. <laughs> They're incredible. So we were talking, when I met um, with the ladies the first time when we were talking about uh, the integrated pest management, and uh, we talked about uh, how that IPM does state that um, you can use pesticides, uh, well, but when necessary. We were talking about maybe changing that. I mean, remember that conversation? You're like, because it really shouldn't be in there, right? Because we're sh shifting away from all of this stuff. but it, Integrated pest management does say that if you if you have to, after doing all this, you can't get the population down. Um, you can use poison, but I don't think that that's always necessary. It might take longer uh, to get the population down and seal everything up, 
but it's in my experience, it works as long as you're staying on top of it. It takes more <coughs> manpower to do it this way, give it uh, to do the holistic approach and not use poison, um, but you're paying attention to it. All right. Implementation control methods are effective, least impact on non-target organism, organisms and the surrounding ecosystem. So we didn't talk about the ecosystem, right? So by not using poison and using some of these methods that I'm talking about, like exclusion work um, and using snap traps, right? And the reason these have been around since 1892 is they work um, and they're safe. Um, but the ecosystem is being affected, right? So the less poison we're using, the less poison that's going in the water. I mean, there was I, uh, there was talk articles about you know rodents uh, uh, dying and then that getting into the into the water, right? If they're near a well, if you've got to have enough rats that have been poisoned and they're near a well and they're decomposing, is it getting into our water? Possibly, you know, that's scary to think about. So here's one of my guys setting up. This is one of the tools that we use. It's uh, very proud of the acronyms. It's called RATS, Rat Action Tunnel System. So it's contained and it's discreet, and you just put snap traps inside those tubes. You will remove those there. But um, you bait out. I use organic bait. I make my own bait. Um, we use a few things. I use like some bacon grease. I love bacon grease and peanut butter and seeds and corn and stuff. So we'll bait out on the ends and then we'll bait the snap trap on the inside. I don't always use the Victor snap traps. There's some other ones. What's nice about this too is that you're more apt to get them with their head in and it's a quick painless, right? As opposed to because they have to go into the tube. So there are things you can do. You don't have to use poison. There's the longer system. That's actually at that house in Linfield that I was telling you about. Um, that was, they were going to take down compost. Mm -hmm. A lot of good compost. But. So here's part of the exclusion work we do. So, good idea when you go home today, go around your house and look at where the utilities are going inside your house. Mice don't need very much room at all. Just think of like a dime. That's all they need to get in your house. So if you have a, even just a small gap where your AC stuff's going in, your electrical's going inside your house, you have a central air conditioning unit, you know, that's running up the side of your house, look around, there's always that foam that's around the pipes. Look at the foam. Uh, is there like the uh, shred, foam shreddings like on the ground? Uh, does it look like it's been eaten? Uh, been eaten? Because they'll chew on it, right? It makes great nesting material. But they'll run right up. I've had, I've done jobs, they run right up inside and gone. In, into the attic. Sometimes mice won't just get in low. They'll run up, get into your attic, and then go down. So be mindful of that. Right? So, but certainly go around your bulkhead. Sometimes there's openings. Go open that door in your basement with the lights off and look for light coming in. Uh, go into your garage and show all the lights off and see if there's light coming in on the corners of your um, your, your, uh, your garage door. They, they get that strip that comes down. If you face your garage door, those strips, those weather strips that go down to the ground, they chew right through that. They're just plastic rubber. Right? They'll chew through it and then they'll get in your house that way. There's clips you can buy. Um, you can go wildlife. I use wildlife control supplies. They're awesome. They deliver quick. The customer service is great. I think they're in Connecticut. Um, they make clips that are about that long. Super easy to put on that strip. Just need a pair of pliers, you slide it on, pinch it, and now that metal piece goes right to the ground and mice on the ground. Hot spot, hot spot, hot spot. I would say probably 65 to 75% of the time they're getting in through the garage through that way. Or getting in through your utilities, getting in your house. Uh, my other guy's doing some prevention work. Ground exclusions. These are fun. So, rats burrow, but so do other animals, right? Groundhogs. I've had. I got a call from Salem one time. Uh, mass. This one time. I've never seen them do this. Raccoons underneath the free season porch. 
they went right underneath. So they'll burrow underneath, typically records don't do that for whatever reason. She had babies. I think she just needed a place to go and found that. It was probably a burrow there already and she went in. The groundhogs are rats will burrow into the ground and go underneath, right? So how do we stop that? Well, we dig a trench, right? So all we're doing here is we're digging a trench all the way around. I go down about a foot, two feet, depends on what it is, and then I attach the hardware cloth, right? I cut strips of this stuff. And then we just attach it and run it into the ground and I build a shelf and we go like that. And then we put the dirt back down and we pack it down. And so if anything tries to dig up against that three season porch or your shed or your deck, um, they're just going to run down and they're going to hit this stuff in there. You'll see the hole that they would be no animal. Great prevention work. If you have a shed and it sets back in your yard and you haven't in a while, go look. You'll see groundhogs are coming. So there'll be a big pile of dirt right next to your shed. Check if you have old trees in your yard um, and there's a, a major root system. Rats love that. They'll dig right in, right in around, right around the roots, make a whole tunnel system around the tree. And then once they get comfortable enough, they're hanging around and nothing's disturbing them, they will get closer to your home. And that goes for any animal. If you let them live long enough by the shed, eventually they're coming to the house. Eventually. So be mindful. The ground scoot, the ground scootings are super, super effective. <coughs> All right. So escars has far reaching consequences, right? Ecosystem stability, the environment. I know a gentleman that does just bugs, and I don't, I don't use poison, I don't do bugs, but we refer work to one another. And so he has a core license, I have a pack license. Um, he has to go to classes like a couple or three times a year to keep his license up. And he was telling me that some of the classes that he's been going to, they are actually talking about shifting out of using poison and using more greener methods, but they're still, they're still using it. Right? So the shift is happening, and it's awesome that all of you guys are here and that we're doing the save the you know wildlife, you know the, that the, the, those ladies are petitioning the town and people are signing stuff and being aware of it and speaking up about it because eventually it's, I, it's not going to get any better, right? And it's affecting more and more animals, and they're coming. And the other piece of this too that I don't think we think about too much is that we we're building so much and knocking trees down and we're destroying all their homes. I mean, they're living here too, right? But so are we. So we're, the more we build, the less space they have. They have to come into our neighborhoods, right? So if they're being poisoned, and they're coming in, and they're, being, they're spending more time in our space, it's definitely going to be a problem, more than it is now, right? So the quicker we get ahead of this, the quicker um, we can avoid potentially more problems that we can't even see yet. All right, that's my presentation that I almost fell through three quarters of the way. Um, do you guys have any questions? Do you like to share any experience? Thank you. Yeah. First, thank you. So, I'll let you go first. So I, um, I'm not sure about vision because I know they're nocturnal, but I know that the rodents and other mammals have a keen sense of smell. I've read that they are opposed to and really refract from mint, uh, the scent of mint, peppermint, spearmint. Have you any experience with using oils as a deterrent? Mm -hmm. um, they can work, but as soon as it rains, they're not, they're not effective in the long run. Right? I've even used, we've done, we do squirrel with solutions too, and I've used, uh, I put the sub called liquid death, I think it's called. But it's just like, it's just uh, 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 capsaicin, just in its liquid form. And I'll spray a little of that just to make it uncomfortable. But it, it, just around where the squirrel hole is, you know, not to hurt them, but to, to give off that, that uncomfortable thing. But as soon as the rain comes, or a couple of rains, um, I've had customers use mint underneath their sheds uh, for uh, groundhogs, groundhogs. Ground I forget what they use it for. Um, and it seemed to work. And sometimes.